Uh, welcome to this instalment of Music Stimulants called The Buzz Meter. I'm Julian Knowles. I'm going to be moderating tonight. I'd like to uh, introduce my panellists to the stage. So we have uh, Everett True, um, who is a uh, legendary music critic, um, originally from the UK, who's relocated to Brisbane. Uh, Everett has written for Melody Maker, NME, uh, Careless Talk, Cost Lives, and most recently Plan B magazine runs a really active, or comparatively active, music blog. We have Scott Horscroft, um, I guess producer of the moment. Uh, Scott, as a record producer, um, has done the presets, uh, the Sleepy Jackson, Silver Chair, Panics, uh, is about to do the Vines next record, and is also the co-owner of BJB Studios in Sydney. So it's fantastic to have a producer's perspective on the panel. And finally, we have Stephen Green, uh, Stephen's a specialist in music marketing and PR. Uh, he owned and ran the company Australian Music Biz, uh, also Outbreak Marketing, uh, has done work for DSTAR, a digital delivery platform to radio, and has just taken on the digital strategy for the new release from John Butler. So uh, a very well um, qualified panel. Uh, following our panel, we will be, uh, there'll be a set from the fabulously talented Dan Parsons. So. Uh, Please enjoy. So um, I thought I would start off first with, a, I guess, a, a historical uh, question. Um, for many people, um, Nirvana uh, becoming huge was a sort of a defining moment uh, in terms of redefining what the mainstream could be or redefining uh, the sense of buzz uh, that's emanated from a local scene. So I was going to sort of throw to Everett, who was one of the key participants in the Seattle scene, uh, particularly around the moments where Nirvana was sort of breaking into a global phenomenon. And maybe just start off by asking Everett what you think were the, the key defining moments in that band going from, I guess, popular in a local scene through to being one of the biggest bands in the world. Well, huh. um, the key moments in Nirvana going popular. Well, I guess, one of them would have to be signing to David um, Geffen Company. One of them would have to be signing to um, Gold Mountain Management. That would probably be the most crucial one because as of that, um, they got the um, record contract and they got their producer. And without the producer, the choice of producer, they wouldn't have gone global because their music wasn't um, accessible enough the way that Jack and Dino had produced it on their first album. Um, although, obviously, in retrospect, it is now, which is kind of weird, but that's where it goes. So I guess the key moments would be management, producer, record company, um, oh, and um, uh, just getting MTV on their side. Okay. So, um, in terms of, you know, putting all the elements together. Do you think it was the management that did that? I mean, how involved were the band in actually, um, you know, in, in that success? Were they just concentrating on re making really great music and connecting with their fans? Or was there some kind of conscious strategy that you think that the band had in terms of, like, taking their music to a, a much bigger audience? As far as I'm aware, Kurt Cobain's strategy about getting big was he just wanted to make uh, great rock and roll and he wanted to put out great records and he wanted to sell millions of records. He didn't really care what it, what had to be done to get there. Well, he did care, but he thought he didn't care. So he just told his management he wanted to get big and left it all with them, really. Um, but obviously he was the star. He always had the veto. Um, so he, he had no conscious strategy himself. His management had the strategy, um, I would have said. Um, Obviously, the sound of the band, all of that stuff, all the unimportant things, that's what Kurt had control over. Everything else, the stuff that made them popular, that's what his management had control over. Okay, so one of the things that I distinctly remember from the interview that you did with Jonathan Poneman from Sub Pop Records uh, at a recent Big Sound was that Jonathan was saying, with the label Sub Pop, which he considered to be a, an authentic imprint, uh, an indie label that had a very loyal fan base was that his signing of bands was more around uh, what he called uh, establishing a credible music catalogue. Um, that he wasn't really thinking about, I'm going to sign this band because I think they're going to shift a million units. I'm going to sign this band because they really fit with my artistic and curatorial vision for the sub pop label, that I'm actually building an audience for this label and this band happens to be on this label. 
Um, to what extent do you think, I mean, that's Jonathan's account in retrospect, or it's actually his version of how he runs Suckpop. Do you think that, um, the, was there a particular push around Nirvana from his perspective, or were they truly just one of the bands on the label? Uh, they were truly just one, one of the bands on the label to such an extent that Mudhoney definitely got the push and Tad got the push over Nirvana, for sure. Um, thanks. <coughs> and, um, yeah, but that, that's crucial. I, I, mean, I mean, what Jonathan's talking about is crucial because basically Nirvana could have connected with that many people in a short space of time and did connect with that many people, but they wouldn't have retained that connection without that credibility in their, ba in, in their past. They had to have that sub-pop factor for them to retain and for people still to be talking about them today at the Brisbane Powerhouse. Um, they needed... That sub-pop factor was unbelievably crucial um, and that's something... You know, I mean, the sub-pop guys, they had a bad rap at the time. Jonathan kind of overlooks this. Um, you know, they didn't pay their bands. Um, they, they were constantly going out of business. Um, but they did love the music and they did look for bands with a certain aesthetic, um, a musical aesthetic. And, but no, Nirvana didn't stand out from that, not by, not by any stretch of the imagination at all. Okay, so maybe I might jump forward um, to a local context and forward in time to more recent times and throw to Scott Horscroft on this. Um, Scott, you did uh, the first couple of records for the Presets, who some might, I guess, call as being a fairly recent band who there's, was a really significant buzz around that kind of, like, uh, I guess, broke a particular musical angle or musical style. Um, to what extent do you think, um, you know, that was driven by the band's ambition? Can you maybe just give us an account around the presets of what you think were the defining moments in them kind of breaking through? Well, you know, you're talking about two guys who are extremely uh, dedicated. They both went to con the conservatorium a high school, so they've been studying music and understanding the music industry since, uh, I think it's year nine that you go to the Sydney Con. Um, uh, you know, two people that came through quite a few different music genres. They were playing big, um, sort of ambient post uh, punk, uh, you know, post rock bands. Um, Julian's, you know, got his masters in composition, and then Kim's a, a you know, big percussionist. So, um, watching them develop um, the style of music, and in a way, sort of chasing what they felt was going to become successful. I think. Um, they hit a, hit, a, hit a point with a lot of kind of very indie crossover things like the, the late fashion label Subi, uh, Modular Records. Um, you know, you know the, what, what they did was position themselves in a real cultural movement, maybe um, very intentional, and wrote for what was happening with that scene where you know, electronic music had been huge. Um, you know, the big French movement, house and all of that stuff, but then punk, bringing punk into that, as did, you know, some of the fashion labels and, and so on that were around at that time were really crossing over um, this sort of high art and, and street art and, and for them that, you know, that, that's what made them very successful. I think there's a couple of interesting points that are emerging here because I guess the traditional view of the Indie Act is that they kind of eschew the kind of overt commercialism and that in fact they're just about a scene and they want to play music that speaks to a scene and if they sell records that's really cool but if they don't sell records well that's fine and, you know so their, their, their sense you know, the traditional view of the Indie Act is that they're uh, on a sort of an artistic mission and 